This episode is brought to you by Munton's Malts, a company that is passionate about providing premium malts to brewers worldwide. For over a century, Munton's has been a leading supplier of brewing and distilling malts, offering the finest British malted barley on the market. You can experience the difference Munton's offers by joining a recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club because every kit that ships out now includes premium Munton's malt. You know, we've known the Munton's crew for a long time, and I can tell you, friend, you're going to love brewing with their grains. Ask your local supply shop to carry Munton's malts, or homebrewers can pick up some right now online at txbrewing.com. Join our Trub Club at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club, be a part of the community, and come brew with us. Thank you, Munton's, for supporting our efforts and homebrewers worldwide. Today's show is brought to you by Hopsterette.com. Grown in the esteemed Yakima Valley on the Pewterball family farm, Hopsterette.com offers the widest variety of hops available online at incredibly competitive pricing. It's simple. They grow hops, they sell hops, and they ship hops straight from their family-owned farm to your doorstep. Producing the highest quality hops is Hopsterette.com's passion, and they're proud to be an independent grower in the craft beer industry. Go to Hopsterette.com right now and get what you need to make your brew day better. That's Hopsterette.com. Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam-packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining Entertaining shows shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Storing pre-mint sanitizer, yeast and clear beer, putting a faucet together and cleaning your beer lines. This is Homebrew Happy Hour. Episode 323. Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com. Click on that submit a question link at the top of the page, or now you can call, leave a voicemail, Get a $25 gift card to KekinEdition.com at 325-305-6107. I am your host, one of your hosts, Joshua Steubing, joined as always by my co-host. He is the director of operations at cmbecker.com over there, Mr. James Carlson. And directly below me, B-E-L-O-W, the president and chief keg watcher of KegConnection.com. And no neck brace. You look incredible, Mr. Todd Burns. Gentlemen, what, how, welcome. You. you do. You look good, boss. Yeah, I got my scar, though. Did you see that? That's, yeah, that, you know, as, uh, uh, that you're just missing the, ah, my name is Todd Burns machine, and you'd have a hell of a Halloween costume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's gnarly you don't have to it's just open or what or is it stable uh, I've, I've been keeping it covered and they told me at the <laughs> doctor's visit yesterday that that it was fine just to leave it open <laughs> that's so <laughs> sorry I mean, it'll heal quicker I, I believe it it's just wild because it is just a gaping hole this is enough reason for here uh, talk so i can uh, so that zoom goes to you okay well, what do you want me to, uh, well I, I will mention this all the stuff you're doing right now with uh, Tai Kwan Jiu-Jitsu, Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, sorry. <laughs> it, this is this is a preview <laughs> of 
of some of the things you're going to deal with when you get older. Yeah, or like I was making fun of you with the, what, I don't know what those voice boxes are called, but if I don't stop smoking, that could be my future too. That could be the True. the tracheotomy yeah. surgery or whatever. God, yeah, looking at, looking at you is a glimpse into my future. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I do. Can I, I want to say my favorite Todd Burns story real quick. Speaking of being like you, we were at the, uh, we were on the patio a few weeks ago, James, or it might have been a month ago, and just BSing, you know, ending the night, having a whiskey drink. And I forgot how the, the, the topic of head size came up, but a $5 bet was a Bruin because Todd said something like, Oh, this head. I asked him what size it was, and I forget the number you shot it out. I go, I don't know if it fit my head. And you go, Dude, I have the biggest head of anyone I know. I go, no, my head's much bigger than yours. We didn't bet because of his confidence. So he went and got the tape measure anyway, and he measures his head. And for conversation's sake, let's just say it was 38, right? 38 inches around or whatever it was. And uh, he goes, okay, let's do yours now. And he starts doing mine, and it gets like not even halfway or a little bit past halfway. And he's like, oh, my God, your head keeps going back. (laughs) It would have been the (laughs) easiest. It would have been. <laughs> it reminded me when you uh, from the side, you look like uh, I don't know. There's a sci-fi movie with uh, what was the one? Alien, alien. Or, or cone you, heads. But yeah. yeah, alien. You look. You kind of have that elongated side. It, the look best like the moment. Alien I really wish you had a patio camera because I would. I that would. That's my favorite. It would have been my favorite footage of of us interacting with each other. You, he was so shy. It, it would have been the easiest five dollars I ever won. I've talked myself. <laughs> Out of way more five dollar bets lately, but anyway, let me get us to relevant stuff so people listening have, don't have a reason to tune out yet. Um, in case you haven't heard, let me just go straight to uh, what we're doing in June. There it is on the screen. Y'all can't y'all can't see it, but YouTube.com forward slash Homebrew Happy Hour viewers can. We're going to be in San Diego June twenty second through the twenty fourth for Homebrew Con. We're actually giving a presentation serving your homebrew all about draft beer systems. And I like the way, I apparently, Todd, we spelled draft wrong. I thought the American way was D-R-A-F-T, but they they corrected it and did D-R-A-U-G-H-T because that is the beverage accepted version of spelling it, or I forget how they, why they told me. I, I disagree, but yeah. okay. Yeah, but either way. I mean, if you, if you looked at the vast majority of people that do draft beer installations, I mean, if you start looking at them, they spell it both ways, but I would, I would say, I would just happen to know this because I've looked up every draft beer installer in the United States <laughs> over the last f- a few weeks, weeks while yeah. I've been out. And, uh, most of them, I wouldn't say a, by a huge majority, but most, the majority of them spell it D R A F T. Yeah. Well, now according to the AHA, I'm going to tell them like, listen here, we're in America, but either way. That's neither here nor there. We are giving the talk. It's going to be fun. If you plan on going to a homebrew con, there is a sign up link in the description, or if you're on YouTube there in the, yeah, the video description, same thing. If you're not at YouTube, the show notes, I think is what most podcast apps call it. But all of the links, by the way, for anything we talk about in the show are usually there, but we would love to see you. Uh, Please hit me up. You can actually just text me direct at 325 three zero five six one zero seven if you're gonna be there. We're gonna start planning like what we're gonna be doing uh when the show's not going on, like if we'll do meetups or whatever. I told Todd if if nobody comes to see us there, we'll give our talk and I'll go roll around jujitsu, mess up my neck or something. We'll figure so it out. So I, I looked it up while you were talking. According to Merriam <laughs> Webster, the oh, correct spelling <laughs> for Americans is D R A F T and the correct spelling for the British would, would be the other. Yeah. Well, we will be serving beer at the Muntins booth. So maybe it's appropriate that we just our our talk is D R A U G H T. We want to we want to be all right with the Brit and I'm sorry again. Sorry guys. Sorry. I'm they're gonna I told him I wouldn't until they helped me, and that was a lie. I tried. I'll edit that out. Um, so, yeah, we'll be there in San Diego. Uh, what else do I have going on? I said homebrew con. Oh, yeah. If you want to brew the absolute best recipe we've ever put out in our life, there it is up on the screen. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. Join a recipe receiving tier of our truck club and get the delicious Kolsch shipped out to you. We thank our sponsors of every monthly recipe, Muntins, HopsDirect.com, and of course, Imperial Yeast for providing the most premium 
of ingredients that we can include in the kits. It, I've always been proud of the recipes that James comes up with and I pedal off as my own. I'm extremely proud of, of us being able to offer it with these premium ingredients. I think it just takes Trub Club to a whole new level of, of professionalism and, like I said, top-tier ingredients. Um, it's nice sending kits out in confidence knowing that, I mean, the people receiving them are, are brewing what we're brewing. And and it should, in theory, turn out the way we brew it. So when we talk highly of this coal, you're going to get it and go, oh, my God, now I see, Josh. I see the light. I thank you for evangelizing coal on your podcast every week. And I'll say you're welcome. Uh, and then that reminds me to the next segue, and then we'll get on to the show. We had some feedback lately of people saying sometimes I talk too long about things that don't matter. Oh, wow. Well, I, re- I just realized I completely stopped listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, you know, it's it's one thing for me to tell you to do that, but it's not good marketing to tell podcast listeners to stop listening to me. Like, oh, just just uh, for, I, I purposely. I, I recommend personally just tuning him out when he, when he goes on and on like that. Or there's always a fast forward, too. Go to Col- anyway, go, go to Colshcup.com. We as of recording this right now, one per- I was gonna say before we recorded, we only have one spot left. Someone dropped out this morning. We have two spots left. Colshcup.com. 38 people have signed up. Believe this or not, guys, 38 people have already paid. Everybody that wow. signed up, I know. That's amazing. Yeah. I've, I've sent all the PayPal invoices. Remember, if you're in the Trub Club at any level, you get half off. So go join the Trub Club and then get one of the last two spots. But if the link is live at, at kolschcup.com, then you can be one of the final two people to sign up. You'll know when you, you're not going to get accepted when that link is gone. Or if I get flooded with a bunch all at once who are listening to this, I, I will either make an exception or, or I'll have to just heartbreak the la- whoever was out of the line but either way we'll, we'll figure something out but go to kolschcup.com sign up if you think you can brew the best kolsch in the land I, I i want to try it i i don't believe that you can do it and so you're gonna have to ship me two bottles of your kolsch and i will tell you if it's good or not i think people are on to my scam todd i think they're on to not scam oh, yeah. agenda not scam agenda we um I don't make a lot, guys, but this is just don't take this from me. This is what I want. Having 40 people across the country sending me beer, uh, my favorite style. That's all I want in life. What are we going to say, boss man? Oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> we have questions, right? We do. Stop it. But before we, yeah, that was all the small talk in even more record time. I'm breaking records every week. Before, Mr. Burns, we get to the questions, it's time for listener feedback. Speaking of San Diego, our buddy Stuart from San Diego left us some recommendations for what we should be doing when we're in town this summer. Homebrew happy hour crew, Stuart from San Diego. My mother always said, if you don't have anything nice to share, don't say anything at all. So, Joshua, I'll keep it silent. Um, Homebrew stores, I know we got AHA Homebrew Con in San Diego this year. Uh, You guys were asking for some feedback. Biggest one I use down here is Homebrew Mart to test the Ballast Point, uh, one of the OGs in San Diego. So, all oh, some great beer there. Um, we had a good homebrew store in North Park called the Home Brewer, but sadly, you know, they are no longer. Um, we're looking at breweries to check out. You guys, got to make sure you go to Epic, E P P I G, E P P I G. They have a tasting room on the water down in Point Loma in the harbor area. It was cool to watch the boats, um, but great German beers. Currently looked on tap. They got an alt, Vienna Lager, Doppelbach, Kolsch. There you go, Josh. Um, and three different Pilsners and also the IPAs and all those other things. But check them out. I'm um, excited to have you guys here in San Diego. Thanks. Bye. He came around. He came around. I can, I can handle a friendly ribbing or two and then give him Todd's money. Uh, you, Todd, you've been to San Diego a bunch, haven't you? Yeah, quite a few times. I mean, yeah. like in your previous work life and in the, in, mm-hmm. in the industry, it is. I mean, they're having it there because it is like a beer mecca. Uh, it's a West Coast beer mecca for sure. I would call sure. it. great breweries. I don't know if y'all remember a buddy, a, a longtime listener of the show, Frank. Uh, I won't say his last name, but he he came to Austin once and brought some epic. Do you remember that? I brought the Crowlers, the canned growlers or i think they're called mm-hmm. uh, over do you, do you remember that james i brought a handful yeah. of them um i don't remember what the alt tasted like i don't remember if he actually brought the alt i do remember uh some pilsners 
and um, the Vienna. I do, I specifically remember the Vienna lager being delicious, but that's my experience with Epic. I would love that. Sounds like heaven to just go sit by and enjoying some uh, German beers all night. I think if we can manage that, we'll Uber over to Epic. Do you already have an idea, Todd, of what like normally when we travel? whether it be to a foreign country or another state uh, city, you always typically have like a, I've been here before. Let me take you here because you're going to have a good time. Do you already have that in mind for us? Or I've never even, I haven't asked. No, not really. I mean, there's so many, so many breweries there. It just, you know, like this is one that y'all would probably enjoy because it's German beers. Um, I mean, I've been to a lot of breweries there. Uh, What's the real famous one? That's Ballast um, Point. A ballast point. Yeah. Ballast point. That's right. I was actually, I believe I was at ballast point when I won the, the, the brewing the, system, the grandfather, the grandfather. Yeah. That I, that was where CBC was that year that you won it. I didn't re- mm-hmm. remember that. Oh, I, for, yeah. for some reason I thought it was in Nashville that year. Um, yeah. Ballast point did buy that homebrew mark that he's talking about that homebrew shop. And, uh, apparently they're, you know, very wildly successful. It's one of the, you don't hear that a lot about, uh, brick and mortars these days, homebrew shops, but we would be cool to go check that out too. Uh, yeah. Ball- and Ballast Point, I don't remember. They got bought out. Was it Constellation Brands or who? who I think it was. Right? Yeah. Whoever it was. The unpopular opinion, maybe don't give us a one-star review. I, if, as long as the beer doesn't change, I don't care who owns places like founders breakfast out is still incredible. And even I like their all day IPA and they're owned by Mahalo or whatever the kind of like what Mahal, Mahal, M A. They're owned by a big conglomerate, like uh, overseas ones. I don't care as long as they don't change the beer. Um, uh, not talking about you fat tire, but no, <laughs> I might edit that out. We like fat tire people, but the, why'd they change the, why'd they change the core formula of fat tire? Anyway, Stuart, thank you so much for leaving the feedback. This is a great time to remind you if and when you leave a voicemail feedback or a question, you do get a $25 gift card to catconnection.com courtesy of the recovering voice bots. Mr. Todd Burns, we do have four questions for this week's show, starting off with a voicemail from our buddy Dan from New Jersey. Hey, guys, this is Dan from New Jersey. I have a quick question about um, sanitizer. I heard you guys just talk about it on the last episode but just curious, you know, I don't brew as much as I'd like to. I have a three-year-old son, so that complicates things. But um, when I do brew, I tend to make just like a five-gallon batch of star sand. I have way more kegs than I need. So would I be okay with storing that in a keg um, and then just pulling off of that whenever I need it? You know, would it be good for three months or so if that's the next time I brew? Or am I better off just making smaller batches for the brew day and every time just changing it out. Love the show. Uh, Keep up the good work. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. It's a great question. Um, I too, my pop and I usually do a five gallon batch. That's kind of, you know, the instructions are for, are for that basically like, okay, you put two ounces in for the five or for, for sand step, what, what we're using or we use Iota for, but y'all use sand step. It's one ounce for six gallons. So you make your six mm-hmm. gallon batch in your fermenter. You use, you pull from that to put maybe in a little bucket for your faucet parts or whatever parts you're sanitizing that day, your pouch of yeast, whatever it is. I don't see you guys saving or storing uh, ever. Is that because of, the lack of longevity of it, or is it just like, nah, it's easy enough to make a batch every brew day. I'll throw it to you first, Todd. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, all the different, all the sanitizers are different. I would say first. So star sand, they, if you, I believe they say that this is an EPA registered sanitizer, it it's supposed to be used within an hour of mixing it. Now, if you if you go to sites and you and hear what people say, what they'll say is, if it becomes cloudy, it's done. If it if it's uh, if the pH level is above three, it's done. Uh, sand step is more like four point five. If it's above four point five, it's done. And the cloudy, interestingly enough, doesn't really mean it's done. If your if your sand step is cloudy. It's either because you mixed it very cold or you mixed too strong of a solution. So it's a little bit different there. As, as far as storing uh, sand step, um, 
you know, you, you can store it as, and, and watch to see what that pH level is. I, I don't. I, I mix it up. I use it. I, I, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm done with it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I get rid of it. Um, it's, you know, it is fairly expensive, I think. So it's like 20 bucks for 16 ounces. And again, I'm talking about sand. I don't use star sand, so it's hard for me to talk to that. Sure, I use sure. sand step. Yep. Um, so it is expensive. What that works out to like, just do the math for me, a dollar 25 an ounce, How dare uh, an ounce, right? How dare you. So it's a dollar 25 for six gallons. And I think the directions, if I remember right, don't take my word on it, read the directions, but I think it's, it says one to two ounces. I use an ounce. It's always worked perfectly at an ounce. Uh, so yeah, that's, that basically costs you a dollar 25 for that six gallons. I just, I, I don't save it. I, it's not worth it to me. I'd rather me- mix up a fresh batch and know it's going to work and not run a huge batch, you know, 17 or 15 gallons of beer because I was trying to save the sanitizer. It just to me personally, it's, it's not worth it. But, you know, again, you got to, depending on what sanitizer you're using, you got to look at the directions and, and, and see what the manufacturer says. That is a good point. Like you said, you don't want to be so frugal that your mistake cost you a much bigger batch of beer because it is not an effective sanitizer anymore. But like James, I know not, not saying you're keen frugal. We're all frugal in this group. We're all brotherhood of frugality. Um, but I don't, again, I don't see you saving it. Uh, po- no, I po- just mix what I need when I need it. You know, is there any particular, re- is it again, because you're like, I just want to make sure it's, it is re- ready to go when I need it to be ready. Yep, that's exactly. I'm Todd answered that question perfect. I'm on the same page. It's uh, it's. I just don't want to risk. Uh, you know, it can lose its potency over time. So just mix what you need when you need it, and then you you don't have to question whether it's going to be good. Now, again, I'm I'm king of dragging out questions, Todd. Don't get annoyed, mm-hmm. but I, this will be a follow up from people. So I'm just doing my due diligence. What is it's oxidation a factor of what causes? the degradation of the sanitizer or is it just it can't be in water that long without losing like i'm saying like if you purged a keg and you like in the best case scenario you were able to close transfer your your solution or you mix it in there and then you purge the top off and rid that whole keg of sanitizer of all oxygen it's just a, a blanket of co2 permeated in this now uh cart mm-hmm. <laughs> would that help give some life longevity to that batch in theory or am i just stupid well, that's an excellent question, I think. I have no idea. Okay. No clue. <laughs> okay. <Yep. laughs> oh, man. But it is a good question, though. It's That's not in the directions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it is not in the Yeah. Well, in that, I don't, it's not a liability thing, but I know we've been, I've gotten feedback before, especially with yeast, because we're sticklers of saying, people will say, what do you think about this and this? And we're always like, at, well, at the end of the day, refer to what the manufacturer says because they know their product best. And that's not us doing a cop out as much as us like we didn't make the product. And if somebody leaves feedback and says, actually, Josh, I here's what I do. I do purge my keg it, w- after I've filled it with with my sanitizer and it is effective. And I've done pH strip tests to prove it. This or this. That's wonderful. But the manufacturer says this. And that's why that's always kind of our 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 go-to answer a lot of the time is because they know how their product is supposed to be used for maximum efficiency. Well, I think somebody like star sand, they're looking at it as an EPA registered product, which sand step is as well. Um, they're, what they're saying is, you know, you mix it, you use it within an hour. That's what the EPA says. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, psh, EPA is made up anyway. I don't listen to those jokesters. Uh, I, this is a great time to solicit feedback, though. What do you do for for your for your sanitizer? I would love to some feedback. And again, too, we I, I did say last week or maybe two weeks ago how oh our feedback line is getting full. Do questions, do both. But this one particularly, yeah, I'd love to hear what you do or leave it in the comments below at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour because uh, I, I finally was acknowledged for asking a good question, but Todd nor James knew the answer or have an answer because like you said, none of us do it. We, my pop and I use iota for, I've never even read the directions beyond the, the solution mix. I have no idea if iota for stores better. Some people may call and go the science behind I, it. I don't, I don't think any manufacturer is going to tell you to store it. 
once it's oh, mixed up. Right. You know, I, I think. I, that, I mean, I just I think that that's too big of a risk for them. I mean, you got to realize most sanitizers are sanitizing. They're not sanitizing to make sure your beer comes out good. They're sanitizing to make sure that you don't get some terrible sickness and die. Right. So right. Uh, the stakes are a little higher from the EPA when they're talking about a sanitizer. That is true. That is true. So Dan, thank you so much for submitting the question. Again, reminder, when you call in and you leave us a voicemail as a question or feedback to 325-305-6107, you do get yourself a $25 gift card. If you email joshua at homebrewhappyhour.com or leave us a text at that same number, you still get a $15 gift card, which I think is pretty stinking good. Like our second question of the day, our buddy Ray sent us a text message and he wrote, is yeast the biggest factor for clarity? Same Kolsch recipe once with 05. He's talking about the dry yeast, uh, say fail 05. Uh, but then another with WY2565, which is liquid yeast from Y yeast. And the 05 won't clear up. 2565 looks clear as day. What you think? And I like he actually wrote what what chew, C-H-U. What you think? That's how I say it when I say it out loud. What you think? Um, James, what you think is, uh, is yeast your, the biggest factor of your beer being clear, assuming you're not going to do any filtering or any of that. What's the biggest factor for why one Kolsch cleared up and the other didn't? Well, the it's, it's, I would imagine the Y yeast is probably a little more flocculent than the O5. In other words, it's not as powdery. So when it goes dormant, it, they clump together and, and fall out of suspension clear. A lot of the what I've experienced in a lot of the traditional German strains, but this isn't a German strain. I'm just giving an example. Right, right. A lot of the old school German strains are uh, really powdery, so they're very low flocculent, so they don't flock together and, and drop out of suspension. They stay powdery, and so it takes a lot longer time for the O5 to drop out clearer than it would be for the Y yeast. If you see a immediate, a good, a good example is the, the, the yeast we use for the Kolsch in Imperial. Dita. Yep. That will drop out really clear. Um, a, a huge difference. If you were brewing both and you used an, a, a competitor's Kolsch yeast, it's amazing. The difference um, we've seen it and we've, we've had, fairly clear beer and kegged it in a week, you know, cause it gets done real quick and it settles out. I will say this, if you chill it, chilling, it seems to help it get clearer quicker than leaving it at room temperature. Absolutely. Todd with, in your experience, have you brewed, I mean, you also, you're not of the three of us. This is actually more of a question for me because you don't brew the same batch frequently. Like you're usually you come back years later, like, oh, okay, I'll do that ESB from two years ago or that California comedy yeah. from five. But but do you have you had to either by uh by default or you just chose to change things up? Have you ever noticed, oh, a yeast choice made a huge difference in the brightness of my final beer? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh oh five is considered medium flocculation and the other one uh 2565 right yes sir is that's an actual a kolsch yeast strain so that comes from a brewery in cologne i don't know if it's the same one that that imperial uses or a different one but it comes from a brewery in cologne so it's very low flocculation and, and you're you're going to get a very clear beer with it I have used O5 probably more than any other single yeast that I that I've used for anything. So I've used it a lot and I've gotten very very clear beers out of it, but always because I I, I you know, I bring that temperature down and and I give it a long rest at a very very cold temperature. So, uh you know, that I think that makes an enormous difference, but there's definitely you you're you're definitely you know, from the same amount of time Maybe not cold crashing it. You're you're going to get a lot clearer to your beer from 05. Uh, and, and I would imagine the taste of your Kolsch is going to be somewhat different as well. You know, it, 05 is great because it's very neutral. Right. But, you know, the only, if you've got a, if you, if you have a, a type of beer that's influenced greatly by the yeast, then you're going to get a much different taste than a very neutral yeast like 05. 
Yeah, I, I, I had a question I was going to ask, and it totally blanked. It's God telling me, don't drag out a question. Um, oh, no. Good. Let's, <laughs> we can go on then. <laughs> no, stop it. How dare you? No, no, no. I did remember what I was going to say. The, the, uh, like you said, there's other factors. I, 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 get, I know his question was literally as yeast the biggest, but like you, you brought to mind time. Like, well, how quick did you dispense from the keg after, after kegging it? Would, or, or he didn't say if he kegged. I'm just making assumptions because who bottles these days? Um, but like, yeah, if you, you have a green Kolsch that you just pulled off of primary right to the keg and dispense it, it's going to probably not be as clear as that no. keg that you secondaried for a month and a half or how long that one Kolsch I gave y'all. Was it three months after? Like how I kept forgetting it. Remember? I, I don't really know. But you remember, yeah, I, but, it, but I kept forgetting yeah, it. Forget definitely. You're definitely right. It, it was I think so that's going to have an enormous factor on the clarity as to how long it's going for. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, I use a lot of times I'll go directly from my keg that's on the gly I mean, sorry, the fermenter on the glycol system that's, you know, that's 17 gallons. I usually have end up with 15 gallons of beer out of it because of all the yeast and stuff at the bottom. I have noticed that when I go directly into that to a keg, it's inevitably it's it's much more cloudy than if I go from there to a secondary glass carboy, put it in my fridge, let it sit for a long time and then transfer it from that. So, and, uh, and I can hear people yelling at their, at their screens or through their iPod, their ear pods, whatever that it's secondary. doesn't matter. You don't got to do it. But I will say, anecdotally speaking, I'm with you, Todd, where if I, if I want that beer to be as clear as I think it can get, I, I try to allot myself like three to four weeks of, of cold crashing of letting it just sit yeah. and, because yeah, the, the Kolsch that my pop and I just had the first batch, I let sit for a while. And, and it was, it's just, it's, or pardon me, the one we have now sat even longer. It, it's beautiful. It's in there. And I know sure. at the end of the day, it's probably just a aesthetics, a personal preference thing. I love a clear beer. It makes me feel like a pro brewer. Uh, well, it, it tastes better. It tastes better. I agree. And again, people are mm -hmm. yelling at us, James. They're yelling at their screens. It doesn't matter. No, it does. To me, it tastes better 100% yeah. every time. It's so I'm sure it's psychosomatic, but just if it's something looks good, it's going to naturally make you think it tastes better. Absolutely. And I know not to go down. What, do you, what would you say, Josh, going down a what? Oh, obviously a rabbit trail. A, a rabbit trail, yeah. <laughs> not to go down a rabbit hole, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it does. I think when people talk about a secondary finishing of a beer and they say you don't need to do that, I mean, there are, there's definitely pros and cons, and I think we need to acknowledge that. When you do a secondary, you're always upping your chances uh, of, of oxidizing your beer and having a worse tasting beer because you did a secondary. And I think that's the main reason people are fearful of secondaries. Uh, now, you know, to, but, but what we do is, or what I do is I'm very careful to transfer the beer in a closed environment so that I don't ever introduce any oxygen to it. Now you don't necessarily have to do that to keep it from, to keep from having an issue. But I think what you would need to do is at least purge that secondary vessel with some CO2 if you have it available. You may not if, if you bottle. Uh, and then also make sure you, you transfer to the very bottom of that and not not let it fall in from the top. And that's going to make more difference than probably anything. You know, you a video, I could republish it at Homebrew Happy Hour, our, our YouTube page, but it's one of the most successful Ked Connection. Once upon a time, Ked Connection had its own YouTube channel. You're transferring to a set or from a secondary to a keg. Extremely popular. And that also shows like a basic setup of people who can't do closed transfer, how to do it the best way to, to eliminate or, or, maximize or, or eliminate, try to eliminate the potential of oxidation. And uh, I think that's why people enjoy that video so much, Todd, is because you do go out of your way. Well, and part of it to be like, hey, at this point, though, when you're transferring, it's already basically alcohol, but we're going to be safe. And let me show you how we do it. Blah, 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 blah. But yeah. you're, you're right. The, the worst thing would be I have a very clear cardboard tasting beer. That would not be enjoyable. Right, right. But um. But yeah, that's gonna now I'm gonna get a, a inbox flooded of feedback about why why Todd Burns is an idiot for secondarying. But the clear beer, here's what I did on the last batch. I, I went straight from my all rounder 
to the keg, the floating dip tube ensured, well, first off, I could do it under pressure, so it was closed transfer. The floating dip tube ensured I wasn't going to get any of the nasties, and, and it's also a clear vessel, so I could see it and, and cut it off before any of the trub came up with it, and I just cold condition it in the keg, and I think that's my what I'm doing going forward now, that was like, that ended up being best results for me. We did get a tiny bit of stuff that did come over at the very bottom. And that's how we knew, all right, the kids floated when we started bringing that stuff up. But I mean, it was, we're talking, you know, eight ounces worth of it, or, or maybe a pint worth tops. But either way, I, I am a believer now of that. But yeah, you're, I, we're talking though to the guy you, your beer is usually always clear when the style calls for it and a lot of the times it's because you meticulously secondary and and go through that whole process of like you said close transfer just to make sure the beer is clear but not infected or oxidized so thank you ray so much for submitting that question we're just flying through moving on to our third question of the day it's another voicemail this time it's our buddy chris from massachusetts Hey, Todd. Hey, James. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in the voicemail, uh, Josh specifically requests that we say nice things about him. I do. You guys aware of that? Anyway, uh, my question is with regard to uh, tap uh, the, the faucets um, that you put on your tower. Now, I had a leak recently on my faucet, and I, I'm having the hardest time understanding how these things are supposed to be put together because there's two bits that go on the top of the faucet. There's one that's kind of like a harder plastic and there's one that's kind of like a softer gasket kind of material. Which one goes down, you know, which one's on the bottom, which one's on the top. Uh, I think this is where I, I, I had my leak and I think this is, and I, I made a giant, of course it was a stout and it made a giant mess all over the basement floor, finished floor, uh, rug, the whole thing. Anyway, it was a mess. Um, but yeah, I think I think I might have these things reversed. And of course, I looked at all my other faucets, and they're you know one of them this way and the other one's that way. And so I've, I've got them all screwed up at this point. So you put the soft rubber one on the bottom, and the hard plastic on the top, and the hard plastic on the bottom, and the soft one on the top. Anyway, I figured you guys are the keg guys. You would know. I uh, appreciate uh, the show. Love you guys. And uh, yeah, they, this is Chris from Massachusetts, and I'm not going to leave my number. I think Josh will figure <laughs> it out. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Good, thank you. And I, to, for the record, I do solicit compliments. I don't solicit phone numbers. Okay, people who leave them, they're doing that to make sure they get their money from Todd. But um, I do. Yeah, I gotta ch- I gotta update that voicemail, I guess, because that was the original one of, "Hey, thanks for calling. Uh, if you want me to play it on the show, suck up to me." Da, 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 da. My wife calls it my radio voice when she hears that version of it, where it's like KWTC or whatever I do. Um, I should have asked before recording for one of y'all to grab a faucet and, and we could do a visual. Uh, I knew you had. Oh, both of you. <laughs> you guys do read the questions before the show. Mm-hmm. James, I'm throwing it to you. You're the faucet man to me. I know, Todd, you're the draft man, but James is the faucet man in my life. So let's, let's start off, James, with with that. You're holding a standard, plain old chrome-plated okay. faucet. This, this is probably what most people see when they see a draft system. This is a standard faucet. Now, one thing that's un- that's not unique between this is our V3S, isn't that beautiful? It's a forward ceiling faucet. But what they share in common is, first of all, there's there's a couple of pieces here. I had a guy call yesterday, and, and this is what locks the lever to the lever handle. Okay, we call it the lever nut. Okay, so if you're taking one of these apart, you take that off. Now, this is the, the lever bonnet or this actually locks this to the faucet. So when you take it off, you'll notice the first thing to come off is this, what he's talking about, the softer black washer. Now that is called a friction washer. That's what puts pressure on the handle or resistance on the handle from opening and closing. Now the the hard plastic, that goes in first. Now notice that's a ball. So that washer is going to be tapered. When you put that in, you want to make sure the the thin side goes down because it's designed to fit around the ball. So when you put it back in the faucet, you want to put the white, you know, the cut portion down, make it fit on the ball, and then you'll put the black friction washer on last. So when it goes in the faucet, you put it back in your faucet, 
And then the lev the uh, lever bonnet goes on, and then you just snug it. You can tighten that up, and that's going to make a little more resistance for the lever for movement. But that's all you do. And then once you get that done, then you can put the lever nut on, and then of course your knob. And that's all there is to it. Absolutely, Todd. Did he steal your thunder? Because I saw you were proudly holding up a standard faucet too. <laughs> like no, that's exactly what I would have said. You know. The- I mean, the way you can tell is that one of them is concave, uh, and and one of them is flat, and the concave one obviously goes over that ball. So yeah, I knew I could rely on y'all to give an actual. Ad- Mine was going to be like, well, I re- just reverse engineer it when I got the faucet because I I do the same thing, and I know I'm not alone because I get these kinds of uh, uh, emails all the time in the help. I I take you know Todd, Mister, I do my lines every two weeks, and you do your faucets however frequently you take those apart. Every I, two weeks, uh, yeah, every <laughs> shut up, and I I put them in a bucket like you or whatever uh, uh, when when it happens, and, and you see all the pieces, especially if you're doing two, three, four faucets in this bucket. It can be overwhelming when it's not your day to day. When it's not, if you're not in the industry, you're like oh crap. There's a lot of parts here. And then worst thing is when you think you have some assembled them all like an Ikea furniture and there's stuff left over. You're like, wait a second. That's not possible. But yeah, what James showed, I, you demystified it because, yes, it is. Uh, there can be a lot of or the perception can be it's a lot of moving parts. But when you understand like the, the functionality of it, it makes a lot more sense in the assembly. Uh, yeah. And also, I think. It's a really good idea when you're taking anything apart, not just a faucet, and you've never taken it apart before to take a photograph and so that you can remember. Because even with, you know, he, he said, I'm asking about the faucets that come on your tower. Well, we actually have a lot of different faucets we offer with oh, our tower sure. in the drop down menu. And some of those faucets may have more than two pieces to them. So then you've got three pieces that you got to deal with and remember. And uh, that's pretty hard to do. I mean, once you get past, yeah, this one's concave. I know it's going to fit over the ball. Once you get up past that, then it it could get more confusing. Don't we have CM Becker faucets that have more than one piece? Or is that, was that just an old design that we don't use anymore? Uh, The, uh, the X series, they just have a little different internal valve, but they share the same uh, uh, Ball washer and friction washer uses the same so, parts. So some of mine have three pieces and some of them have two pieces. Is that because it was an older design with the three pieces? The uh, the V10, the, the our Premier V10 just uses a taller ball washer okay. instead of a friction washer. But in some instances, you may see that they're interchangeable. The, the taller plastic washer actually does both. It works as a friction washer. Because of the fact that it's a little taller, you can put a little pressure on that and it'll tighten against the ball on the lever, but you can use it either way. They're completely interchangeable. Well, and like what Todd's saying too, like James showed it because that was what was specific to the question. But yeah, a fa- certain faucets like that, that V3S is one that's going to have, like when you take it apart apart, taking a picture like Todd said might be a good idea because yeah, oh, which way does that encapsulated piston go in? And what, you know, there's, there's other things in the assembly of it that a picture w- would resolve that from you freaking out potentially, especially if you're cleaning a bunch at the same time. Yeah. Or you can just give us a call. That's it. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. You, and y'all are literally the ones answering the phone. How, how many times mm-hmm. has that blown people's minds? And I, I just got it this morning, an email in the help inbox where they're like, Todd Burns answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Like, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm answering your email. It's like, who is this again? Who's, who's doing the email? Uh, yeah. The, the, the easiest thing, I think in the parts breakdown of the faucets, like we sell faucet parts for the most com- like common faucets, CM Becker included. Um, that is also a reference point for a lot of people for assembly. Cause it's kind of a breakout diagram, you know, so that they can see what part they're ordering. And that is the order of assembly as well. That's a good reference. But like James said, just, you can give a call at the office and it, it'll be a short phone call. If, if uh, that provides you the peace of mind to put it together. Cause yeah, a leak. Or I, I think you should call Josh. Actually, <laughs> Let me give you, don't you do it. No, we're Chris, moving on. Chris, 
Yeah, yeah, three two five three zero five six one zero seven. But just text it because you can't. I can't answer that phone. It goes straight to voicemail. But anyways, this is a great question. And as always, if you have feedback on this, uh, give us a holler at three two five three zero five six one zero seven, or leave your comment in the YouTube comments below because I know you're you're watching us at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy art. And if you're not. Go give our channel a like, smash the subscribe button, uh, all the other things YouTubers say that I'm told I'm supposed to be <laughs> <Yeah>. saying. <laughs> We're trying, James. I'm trying. I'm young. I'm, can, let, me dig- smash it. Let, I, let me digress real quick. I, I don't know if I already told this story, but it happened again this morning. We were at the coffee shop. My daughter, the, the usual guy who's our barista, uh, this is actually the Kalachi place, the usual person who checks us out. There's like a new girl they're training. All these people are maybe 20 years old. And the guy is trying to suck up to me. I'm wearing this outfit and uh, my hat, my baldiness is showing. And the guy goes, my daughter's there. And y'all know Elizabeth is just sprouting up. She's about to be 13, but she looks like she's going on 19. I hate it. It's the worst. But either way, beautiful daughter next to me. And the guy goes, can you believe this guy? That's his daughter. And he has two more. And the girl deadpan without even breaking. She just turns. She goes, yeah, I can see that. Like it's like I'm like I look old. Like the guy was yeah. trying to softball. Like, can you believe he's a dad of a of a teenager? And the lady's like, Yeah, yes, absolutely, it's believable. Um, yeah. kind of really was a bad start to my day. Now that I think about it. But anyways, Chris, thank you so much for leaving that. Let's move on. We got one last question. It was through the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Our buddy Jeremy wrote in and he wrote. Hello, guys. I understand that it is necessary to flush any cleaning solution through my beer lines and then to flush clean water afterwards to rinse those lines of the detergents. However, I do not understand what temperature my cleaning solution should be, and I need help understanding what length of time I need, if any, to allow this solution to sit in the lines before flushing them. I finished setting up my kegerator system from your store site. I know it won't be long and before I need to clean those beer hose. Thank you for the customer service while ordering. Jeremy, he had said it was, uh, I think you, James, last week helped him with an order. But either way. It is true. He didn't pick up a beer line cleaning kit yet, but he watched the video. I had followed up on this, but th- this is uh, one that we could have included in that video. It wasn't, but y- you don't, I mean, you don't let the beer line, the solution, the brew clean, pardon me, just sit in there for a long period of time. Or do you, Todd? I forget. An hour. You do let it sit in the lines for an hour, not just, okay. Uh-huh. It, was that covered in the video? I, I edited the video, but I don't uh, know. I have one of the instruction sheets right here. I don't know if it, I can't remember if it says it or not. I'll, uh, James, when you're clean, see, we, we let the, the I mean, he can't even hear me. If it, if it doesn't <laughs> say that, oh, you're going to be in so much trouble, Josh. <laughs> you, you, so much trouble. You wrote the instructions. I just made them pretty. Uh, oh, oh, no. I'm, mm-hmm, oh, no. Mm-hmm. You can talk about something else while I'm looking it yeah, up. Yeah, I'm going to update my LinkedIn resume. Uh, <laughs> I'll open up a new tab. Uh, w- open to So I, I know it says it on the bag that we put the brew clean in. Okay. Um, well, I I mean, we when we use it, we do we let you know all of our parts in the bucket that has brew clean in it soak for an yeah, hour. It says it, it says um, at the end of the hour reinsert the ball lifter and allow the clinic solution to fully drain. So yeah, okay. we, we cover that in the instructions. It's also on the, uh, on the package for brew clean. And I'm assuming he's asking about brew clean. Cause if he's going to get a kit from us, that's what it would have in it. If you're using a different clinic solution, you just want to read the instructions, but <laughs> you know, there's two different types of solution. I mean, there's probably more than two, but the two main are, are alkaline and acid. And, you know, what we're using is an alkaline and it's, you know, it, it, so we leave it about an hour with an acid. It may be something like 10 or 15 minutes. I just don't remember. Uh, it's just, you know, the acid is just not quite as safe and it, it, you know, it's not really going to do a better job. It's just, uh, it's just a different way to do it. So, uh, you know, it just depends on, on what the cleaner is. Well, and while we're promoting brew clean, uh, because we do believe in it as a superior cleanser, uh, your pop and you worked with, uh, the chemical company, 
um, gosh, it's got to be going on 13, 14 years ago, because it wasn't that long after I started working for you, which is going on 15 years, that y'all worked on a formula specifically to uh, address like beer stone and things that were that equipment was uh, in our industry were likely to get on it. So, I, I mean, I've seen I have not seen brew clean not be able to handle something when you give it that full hour and and as far as temperature goes todd i've always i i never actually measure the hottest that comes out of my tap but i get yeah. it as hot as it can come out of my tap and that's that, what i do i get it as hot as it'll come out of the tap and that all depends on where you have your hot water heater set but i would say on average james what do you think it's probably going to be somewhere between 125 130 somewhere in that range yep yeah probably 120 i think my hot water heater is 125 is that a, a like? Can we set that kind of thing, or is that just a regulation? Like yeah, that? there's a. Well, I've got electric hot water heater. You can pull the the. There's a. Uh, there's two elements on electric. One at the top, one at the bottom. You can pull the panel off and move the <laughs> insulation aside, and you can see there's a little adjustment. There's a thermostat you can change. Oh my god! Yeah, gosh. so you can do it on either gas or electric. It's easy to change oh the temperature. Gosh. Well, not maybe easy is not the right term, but. Uh, yeah, it I'm on it's, it I'm like- it's a total pain in the ass because I have to crawl over a fridge and <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or your one yeah. God, yeah. you you put that one in the barn up like the attic space. And right, I, right. I remember one time I was up there, and not up there, but I was at the barn, James, and, and it was only freezing cold water. And basically Todd told me, suck it up, or if you want a hot shower, you can go to the house. So I was taking cold showers because he was like, you know, a bit of a pain in the and I forgot what you were doing that week anyways. But um I don't I don't want to tell my wife that because we have an electric one. I hope it's too difficult to do. She takes scalding hot baths and she's always like, I wish it was even hotter. I'm like, I think that's gonna kill you. But yeah, but a lot of the newer if it's a newer house, a lot of the faucets and the shower faucets that have scald protection. I bet you that's and, what's going uh, on. Honestly, yeah, it'll it'll prevent that from happening. Yeah, it's, well, sometimes it's, it's a new we the it's a new water heater to the house. Like when we bought the house, it was less than a year old. The the lady who we bought this from replaced it and some other stuff. But um, anyways, I'm digressing, going down way too many rabbit trails, Todd. Um, yeah, with the with the cleaning, the, it's funny because we Todd and I just answered a question in the help in bots, and uh, Todd. boldly claimed again that he uh, every two weeks every two weeks you don't do it every two weeks that's like your average i've i know you're not doing it every two weeks still pretty i mean not yeah you're right i may go three weeks one time and (laughs) just decided a week week later i need to do it you know the next time but i don't know yeah two weeks is the last two weeks you probably have it it, no, that's what no. that's what I was going with uh, it. I was like, yeah, I know you have it. You've been out of commission, man. You've been- <laughs> I, I could clean the beer lines. Uh, maybe I need to do them again tonight. Yeah. So I mean, you know, they're not hard to yeah, do. Yeah, and you're not lifting. You you're not lifting. Yeah. yeah, I can't lift would be the biggest problem for me right now. So I'd have to use a very small amount of of cleaning solution in my little keg because I can't lift more than twenty pounds now. Oh my mm. gosh! I you're gonna be in suffer. Well, I'm coming up the whole next week. Oh, I'm saving up. Stuff I know. For you to move. I know you are. You and Liz. Yeah, we got to redo my kegerator. <laughs> uh, my brother helped me with it some. I got I the it. kegs in there, but I need to move them around, hmm. to, uh, take some stuff out, and I uh, put some stuff up above. Oh man, I'm gonna. I got tons of work for you to do. I knew it. It's gonna you, be great. It is. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have. The moment I said, James, instead of me coming up for two days the next two weeks why don't i just come up the whole last week he was like deal done do it yep <laughs> like just gonna be uh, but the good thing is i'm gonna be eating really really good so that, oh yeah that's what liz always does she has a honeydew list but then she she just feeds me the best food ever it's a win-win like i, I totally forget how uh adverse to manual labor i am because i'm full of carne de sada but anyways jeremy thank you so much for submitting that again final reminder guys if and when you do a text or use the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com you still get a 15 dollars gift card but if you want the big money all of todd's money leave us a voicemail at 325-305-6107 you're likely to get your question played in the future because i'm running low on actual questions i do have a crap ton that's that's uh, imperial measurement crap ton of feedback which will if it's good feedback we'll still use it but if you have a question Leave us a voicemail because Todd wants to know it's real people watching this show. So leave us a voicemail and uh, we will get that played in the future. Guys, that's all I have for this week's show. Greatly appreciate y'all's time. Todd, you're crazy for coming back to the office so quick, but it's good to see you and that gaping hole in your neck. Uh, James, I'll catch you Monday, my friend. Okay. 
Take care. Y'all Bye. too. And that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com. Click on that submit a question link at the top of the page. Or like I've said a thousand times, call in, leave a voicemail, be Todd's best friend at 325-305-6107. Thank you to our sponsors like Muntins Mall, premium grains for a better brew day. If you aren't already brewing with Muntins, give them a try by visiting txbrewing.com or join our chub club at a recipe receiving level. For the best hops available online, give our friends at hopsdirect.com a visit and pick up what you need for your next brew day. Also, get a pack of Imperial Yeast along with premium recipes from us when you join the Trub Club. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and come brew with us. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>